My name is Matthew Garrett. I work for Nebula. We produce a cloud appliance device which lets people set up private clouds. Uh, one of the aspects of that is, of course, concentrating on security, making sure that people can trust that their cloud is running the software that they expect it to run, which is what ties into my work on Secure Boot, uh, which was initially done as part of just in a, ensuring that Linux would be compatible with Secure Boot implementations when Windows 8 launched last year. Let's give a quick overview of what Secure Boot is as a theoretical level, why Secure Boot exists, comparing Secure Boot to restricted boot, um, differences between these things, and then look at some of the ways that we can actually use Secure Boot in ways that benefit the user rather than harming the user or seeking to control the user. So what is Secure Boot? Secure Boot is pretty straightforward in theory. It's the idea that your system, be it a laptop, a desktop, a server, or even a cell phone, will refuse to run software that is not trusted in some way. And the usual way for this to be implemented is by cryptographically signing your low-level software, so typically the bootloader, with a key that is trusted by your system firmware. When your system attempts to ex well, sorry, when you request that your system execute a binary, because that's the configured bootloader, for instance, the firmware reads the bootloader into memory, calculates a cryptographic hash of it, and then verifies that this cryptographic hash matches the signature that's on the binary. And if it matches the signature, that's good. It means the binary hasn't been modified. The next thing it has to do is to verify that the signature was made with a trusted key. And the idea there is that the firmware has a set of trusted keys. Software that's trust, uh, signed with a trusted key is then trusted as long as it hasn't been modified. So if the signature matches, if the hash matches, then the binary can be trusted. The firmware knows that it can execute it. Now, when I talk about secure boot, there's a little bit of terminological importance here. Secure boot has been used as a term from the UEFI specification. UEFI defines a replacement, a, a modern firmware standard that's used in most PCs, replacing the most new PCs, replacing the traditional BIOS. Uh, systems nowadays that appear to have a BIOS are usually still UEFI based at some level, and then run what's called a compatibility services module that provides a BIOS emulation layer. They're still UEFI underneath and can usually be switched into UEFI mode. Any system you buy that was intended to ship with Windows 8 will be in UEFI mode by default and will implement Secure Boot. Now, Secure Boot, as I define it, and as the Free Software Foundation define it, is a implementation that performs this kind of cryptographic validation, but which is under the user's control. Now, at the most obvious level, that means that the user can choose to enable or disable this validation. But it also means that the user is able to replace the existing keys with the user's own choice of keys. That is, the user who possesses the device, who perhaps pays money for the device, is able to choose who they trust. Now, why would you want that? Now, this is what a normal system boot process looks like, except there's more electrons flying around in the real one and fewer blue boxes. Now you have your firmware, and the firmware loads a bootloader, and the bootloader is then responsible for loading your operating system. And this is all very straightforward. You go from step to step to step, and obviously you end up with your operating system. But in this world, in this traditional environment, there's no validation of any of these steps. The firmware launches the bootloader no matter what the bootloader is. The bootloader launches the operating system no matter what the operating system is. As long as they're compatible, each step will load the next step without performing any other checks. So say we introduce another step. We add some malware here. And we configure the firmware such that it boots the malware. On EFI systems, this would mean we reconfigure the firmware and tell it to load the malware directly. On legacy BIOS type systems, we would replace the boot block with the malware and we would move the original bootloader somewhere else. And now we launch the malware, the malware launches the bootloader, and the bootloader 
unaware that anything has changed, continues to load the operating system. Why is this a bad thing? You've got some malware running here. The malware has stopped running by the time you've executed the bootloader. But at this point, we don't have things like memory protection. We don't have any kind of way of knowing or verifying that the software we're executing is the software we thought we're executing. The malware loads the bootloader off disk. The malware is free to modify the bootloader while doing so. The malware can modify the bootloader such that the bootloader will then modify the operating system when it loads it. By introducing this untrusted component at the start of the boot process, every later stage of the boot process is also untrusted. We're no longer able to verify that the bootloader is good. We can't verify that the operating system is good. And the main reason we can't verify these is, well, how could you verify these? Once you're in your operating system, how do you check that your disk is good? Well, you read a chunk off disk and you check whether it matches what you expected. How do you get that chunk off disk? You ask the operating system to give you that chunk of disk. The operating system that potentially can't be trusted. Any competent malware author is going to have modified your operating system such that you always get back the answer you were expecting, as opposed to, yes, I'm your compromised operating system. So, in a lot of ways, there's huge incentive to attack this stage of the boot process, because this means you're running before any virus checker, you're running before anything that can verify that your system is in a good state. One thing this malware can do is modify your virus checker before your virus checker starts running. And as operating system security improves, attackers are moving earlier in the, pro in the boot process. And it's easy to say, well, this is all theoretical. Um, and it's also very easy to write this off as viruses that work this way were common in the 80s. This is what viruses looked like originally. Viruses used to transmit by writing themselves to the boot sector of floppy disks that you would then boot your system off. And as we got proper operating systems, as we stopped booting off floppies, boot sector viruses went away. And OK, fine. Boot sector viruses have sort of fallen out of the public consciousness. Nobody cares about dealing with them anymore. Turns out that there are dozens of known boot sector or boot process viruses in the wild targeting Windows 7 and Windows 8, targeting modern operating systems. These are not relics of the 80s. These are known items of malware out in the wild. They vary in terms of complexity. They vary in terms of efficacy. Uh, one of the most vicious ones is able to take advantage of the fact that systems running, I think it was an AMI BIOS, had a driver installed that allows you to reflash the BIOS while Windows is running. Uh, this virus was capable of using this driver to copy your BIOS onto disk, insert itself into your BIOS, and then reflash the BIOS, such that every time you rebooted your system, the BIOS would check whether your hard drive was infected, and if not, would reinfect it. You could take your hard drive out, put it in another computer, remove the malware, put it back in your computer, and it would be reinfected. So, malware authors are often clever. Malware authors are often motivated by a desire to obtain your credit card details and passwords. And malware authors think that they can make a decent amount of money doing this, and so they will take whichever avenue they feel is most effective. And right now, we're seeing malware authors attack the boot process. This is a real threat. And so it's very easy to say that when Microsoft insisted that as part of the Windows 8 certification process, manufacturers must implement secure boot. It's easy to say that this is just Microsoft asserting control of a market that was otherwise being beginning to move out of Microsoft's control. Uh, but it's also very easy to say that it is dealing with a real security issue. Now, when I say, remember, I mentioned earlier that Secure Boot, as defined by the Free Software Foundation, is one that is, is a cryptographic 
boot validation mechanism that is under the control of the user. The Free Software Foundation defined restricted boot as something which is at a technical level identical to secure boot. It performs the same validation of the operating system of the bootloader of the various components. But crucially, there is a policy difference. In a secure boot system, the user has the opportunity to choose who to trust. In a restricted boot system, the manufacturer makes that decision and the user is out of the loop. This is pretty hostile to user interests. Restricted boot systems are effectively a statement by the hardware manufacturer that the user is not permitted to modify any of the software on this device. And this leads to problems for people like, well, many of us. Uh, how many people are running modified firmware on their phone? Okay. And Great, that's, I actually stopped doing that a while ago because I found that I kept missing phone calls. Uh, it's not the primary thing. Right, um, which I'm sure there's a moral here somewhere. But on the other hand, there are cases where being able to run modified firmware on your phone is an amazingly good thing. Uh, one obvious aspect is that phone vendors often fail to provide any kind of worthwhile long-term support for their phones. You buy a phone, and then 18 months later, you stop getting software updates. Now, in the past, that wasn't too much of a problem. You bought a phone, it made phone calls. Now your phone is, of course, running hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of lines of codes that deal with untrusted input. Uh, we call that the internet. Well, any kind of, no, never mind. Anyway, so you're downloading untrusted material, your phone's displaying it, and that code is often buggy because it turns out that if there's one thing we've learned in uh, a few decades of writing software, it's that it's really, really hard to write bug-free software. And one of the consequences of many bugs is that you then gain the ability to execute arbitrary code. When the original iPhone was released back in 2007, uh, people were thrilled to discover that it could be jailbroken and further that it could, in fact, be unlocked so you could use it on other carrier networks. But the being able to jailbreak at all was a great thing. And the first software-based jailbreak took advantage of a bug in libpng, uh, the PNG decoder that was being used by Apple's WebKit implementation. By feeding it a malformed PNG, they could execute arbitrary code on the phone, which was then able to execute other code that broke out of the constrained environment and let the user run whatever they wanted to on their phone. That was brilliant, except for the fact that while, yes, obviously that meant that you, the user, could execute the code you wanted to, it also meant that anyone who wanted to track every single phone call you made could do the same thing. So Apple obviously shut that down, but that only happens during the supported lifetime of a phone. If you have a phone that's still running Android 2.3, for instance, the overwhelming probability is that there are flaws in the WebKit implementation such that by visiting a website, you are risking granting access to all your personal data to someone on the internet. And we're not supposed to trust people we meet on the internet. So you really shouldn't give them all your phone data. People on the internet, however, are willing to deal with this by producing these modified firmwares that often contain up-to-date software, and then you can run that instead. Phone manufacturers apparently don't like that. One of the reasons they lock them down is that it makes it impossible for you to continue providing updates to your phone. You can never add new features. The only features you get are the ones the manufacturer wanted. You have to throw your phone away and buy a new one. That's unfortunate. But it also supports artificial business models. Sometimes the reason that they have these constraints is that they want to draw a distinction between a more expensive device and a cheaper device where the only difference is software. And if you could modify the software, you could gain most of the abilities of the more expensive device without paying the extra money. Sometimes it's because they want to tie you into, uh, for instance, a phone contract. You'll have this, you can have this phone for cheap, providing you continue paying for this service. And if you stop paying for this service, your device stops working. Uh, if you can modify the software, then again, you can get around that. Sometimes it's we've implemented some sort of digital rights uh, mechanism entirely in software. And if you were able to replace the software, then you'd be able to obtain a decrypted high quality digital stream of a movie. And then you could put that on BitTorrent or something. 
uh, and they don't like that. So many of these constraints are there to support business models that can only exist as long as the user cannot use this device that they physically possess, that they exchange money for in the way that the user wants to. Restricted boot. It's bad. So, um, since I'm supposed to be talking about good things, we're going to move on now. Secure boot, as I said, is under user control. And I think most people would agree that if you have a device, you should be able to choose what it runs. I should be able to replace the software on my phone with equivalent software. And so maybe that would void the warranty. Maybe that should indicate itself in some way that says to the manufacturer, this phone has been used in ways it wasn't intended to be used in, and therefore certain support uh, options may no longer be available. But fundamentally, I get to make that choice. I get to choose whether I'm willing to step outside the manufacturer's boundaries and ROMs I want to run. But another aspect of that is that if I'm able to choose what my phone will run, I should also be able to say, I don't want it to be possible for my phone to run certain things. I want to define the set of things my phone will run, but also the set of things that my phone will not run, that my phone will refuse to run. And when doing that, you need to start thinking about, well, who do I trust? And, well, okay. Right now, if you buy a Windows 8 device, by default, you trust Microsoft. So as long as you trust Microsoft, it's very, very easy to continue trusting Microsoft. You don't actually have to do anything. Uh, one thing that's not particularly well advertised is that while these systems all ship with Microsoft keys installed, they also tend to ship with the manufacturer key installed. So if you buy a Sony or a Toshiba or a Dell, your system will boot anything signed by Microsoft. It will also boot anything signed by Toshiba, Microsoft or Dell. Only the one you bought it from, and if you buy it to Shiva, it won't run stuff signed by Dell. Probably. I haven't actually tried, but uh, you'd hope that that would fail. Now, say instead you're a Linux user, say you run Fedora, and say you want to say, well, okay, I believe that the people involved in the Fedora project do appropriate checking of the software they ship. I believe that despite working for a medium-sized corporation, they are mostly untainted by evil. Uh, I believe that, by and large, they're lovely people. I used to work for Red Hat, so um, I, I may be a little biased here. And this is something you can do right now, today. The Fedora bootloader comes in two versions. One of them is signed by Microsoft, so that it can be run on unmodified systems, on systems in their initial default configuration. This means that Microsoft have signed the bootloader Microsoft have said, we have done some degree of investigation of this bootloader, we know who wrote it, where it came from, and we also have the ability to revoke that signature if it turns out to be used to attack people's computers. But there's also a copy that is signed by the Fedora project. It's a key that's owned by Red Hat under the control of Fedora developers, and which is being used to sign the bootloader. So if you want, you can take a Windows 8 computer, you can remove the Microsoft key from it, and you can replace the Microsoft key with the Fedora key. And that laptop will then only boot operating systems signed by the Fedora project. And if you trust the Fedora project, that's fine. You now have a computer that will update itself, where everything will come down via updates, will still be signed with appropriate keys. You don't need to do anything more once you perform that initial setup. There are various tools for doing this, I'll go over that a little in a minute, but on the other hand, maybe you don't trust the Fedora project. Maybe you only trust software you've built yourself. Maybe you're a Linux from scratch person. Maybe you have actually read every single line of the Linux kernel and made sure that it's bug free, in which case maybe you should send some patches to fix the bugs that you found. <laughs> But again, this is something you can do. You can replace the keys with your own keys. You can choose what you sign. Uh, hang on. Uh, but why would you want to? 
And the reasons may be philosophical. It may be that you want to configure your system to run only free software. Say, for instance, the Free Software Foundation generates the key. Say the Free Software Foundation signed or offered a signing service where any operating system that met the Free, sof uh, that met the free Software Foundation's guidelines, uh, like I think Trustwell and is one, uh, I think there's one or two other Linux distributions that do now. They can sign those. Any system that had this key installed would refuse to boot any operating system unless it had the full set of freedoms guaranteed by the Free Software Foundation. If there were no components that were not modified, that were not modifiable by the end user. I think there's an element of irony here in that you would then only be able to run the copy that the Free Software Foundation gave you if you rebuilt anything yourself, you need to reconfigure your system. But you would know that all the, all the software on your system afforded you that freedom. You would know that no software was acting against your interests, was preventing you from modifying it, was preventing you from giving that modified version to a friend or even an enemy. But there are also practical ones. Maybe you just don't trust big US corporations who may or may not be legally obliged to abide by the dictates of secret courts to hand over your material to other people. Um, maybe you would like to ensure that, say, well, we have no way of knowing at the moment that Companies that produce signed operating systems are not willing to produce a signed operating system that has been modified with a backdoor for a government agency, for instance, such that that could be installed on your computer and all the signatures would still check out, but now your system could be monitored, your behavior could be tracked. And why does anybody do that? Well, we're in an internet world. Even though I assume we still end up as taxpayers paying for people who break into people's hotels, into people's hotel rooms and install bugs on their computers. It's much easier to do it over the internet. And you don't need to bother getting a passport or anything. So someone could attack your computer, replace your kernel with a modified kernel. If the signature is still validated, then you would never know the difference, except that now your keystrokes are being recorded and sent to somewhere that doesn't appear on the map. Or maybe it's just that you don't trust anyone. Perhaps you feel that the only people you want to trust are yourself. Uh, which implies some sort of multiple personality disorder. Let me think of a way of phrasing that differently. Say you're a company and you run a bunch of data centers where you store personal information for your clients or your users. And say you want to ensure that the software you're running is only software that you have validated, that your security team has identified as being appropriately configured. You can do that. You can configure your system such that they'll only boot kernels that are signed by you, kernels that you have built yourself, kernels where you are happy with the security. And that's actually where my professional interest now lies. We're looking at building cloud environments where the compute nodes, the devices that the actual individual cloud instances run on, are running fully verified software from the firmware up. That means that we can guarantee, well, can't guarantee, that means we can make stronger assumptions about the security of the running software, which means it's easier for someone running a guest instance to be confident that another guest instance won't be able to break into them, won't be able to retrieve private data. So there are reasonable practical reasons to want to create your own route of trust. Now, if you want to actually do that, well, it turns out to be pretty straightforward as a technical level. Uh, all you need to begin with is an X509 certificate, and OpenSSL will let you create one. You type OpenSSL um, X509 and then a bunch of magic OpenSSL incantations. And you do that, OpenSSL gives you a certificate. You get a public half and a private half. You keep the private key. Well, private, ideally, you put it on a USB stick or somewhere and hide it and have a passphrase. And then you sign a bootloader with that certificate. And there's a tool called SBSign that will do this. Uh, free software, you can download it, 
run that. You give it a binary and a signed binary comes out the other end. Now, you obviously also need to enroll the public half of the certificate in your system firmware. And on UEFI systems, this requires you to transition to something called setup mode. And the exact mechanism for doing that varies between hardware vendors and in some cases varies between models from the same hardware vendor. So there's no good solid do this, do this, do this, now you're in setup mode. On some systems, it's you go into security and you enter your firmware, there's a security menu and you click a box that says setup mode and that's it. On some other systems, you have to go in and then delete all the existing keys. On some systems, you need to jump through an additional couple of hoops and try to work out if you were translating English into Chinese and then translating that Chinese back to English differently, what would this box say? Uh, you do that, you enroll your keys into your system. You then have one or two further problems. Uh, for instance, by default, the Linux kernel... Well... The job of an operating system kernel is to separate user space from the hardware. Your applications don't speak to the hardware directly, they speak to the kernel, the kernel speaks to the hardware. One of the downsides of that is that... Um, I say downsides, it means that user space cannot replace your operating system with another operating system, because to do that it would need to be able to speak to the hardware directly. But if your kernel can be caused to execute arbitrary code, your kernel effectively becomes, well if you want, a bootloader. The Linux kernel includes a feature called kexec, which allows the kernel to load a new kernel and execute it. So the Linux kernel is a bootloader. And a bootloader that will load unsigned code is unhelpful when you're trying to establish a chain of trust. So in order to prevent that from being used, you need to ensure that your kernel will not execute arbitrary code. Which means also that it has to be impossible for root to cause the kernel to execute arbitrary code. There's a lot of ways that root can currently cause the kernel to execute arbitrary code. Uh, for instance, we have this old interface called slash dev slash mem, which was originally gave root read write access to the entire system memory. Nowadays it's rather more locked down, you can no longer just rewrite chunks of the kernel via this interface, but you can still rewrite, for instance, the interrupt descriptor table, which then means that the next time there's an interrupt you can execute arbitrary code if you want to. So um, yeah, there's still issues there. Uh, the PCI interface was allowing you to cause your graphics cards to DNA arbitrary code into your kernel. There's all kinds of subtle ways of doing this, and there are some unmerged patches that prevent this from being possible on a secure boot system. Linus is, as of yet, not particularly enthusiastic about these patches. Last time we tried to get them merged into the kernel, I'm very aware of this conference's code of conduct, and therefore I'm not going to attempt to repeat Linus's responses. <laughs> I'm sure you can infer certain things. And in terms of actually providing an out-of-the-box secure experience, there's still some work to be done there. If you, say, take the Fedora kernel source code, then you have a nominally secure kernel for these purposes, if you want to build your own system. But this is all if you're taking a Windows 8 system and starting from scratch yourself. Are there any other systems where you can today go and pick up another kind of device and build your own chain of trust? Um, kind of, yeah. Uh, you can take a Google Chromebook, and Chromebooks in fact ship something that is very like Secure Boot. The precise implementation is different, but the same fundamental premise is there. The firmware validates that the bootloader is signed, the bootloader validates that the kernel is signed. The kernel, in fact, it goes further. In uh, Chrome OS, the kernel verifies that the uh, file system is signed, such that you can't modify any of the user space components on a Chromebook. In order to modify those, you have to switch to something called developer mode, and 
every Chromebook has this feature. Sometimes it involves you replacing a jumper on the motherboard, sometimes or flipping a switch. Sometimes it involves you holding down a special key combination. Problem with that is that, um, well, it means you can run whatever code you want. You can disable the Chromebook signing, but you can't replace the keys with your own keys. You have the choice between a device that will either run stuff that Google sign or will run anything. Uh, you can actually replace the keys, but that involves you disassembling the machine entirely, finding a jumper that is next to the flash, switching that jumper such that an area of flash that was previously read-only becomes read-write, running a tool that flashes new keys into that firmware, and then switching the jumper back. And this is likely to void your warranty. Uh, so other examples, hmm, yeah, haven't really found any others yet. If anybody does know of any other systems which have a fully cryptographic boot process and which allow the user to replace the keys, do let me know. I'm kind of stuck there. So we end up in this kind of weird, bizarre situation where uh, the fact that you can buy a large number of systems where the end user is in control, where the end user can replace the keys, is because Microsoft said you should be able to. Uh, Microsoft are, in fact, the only reason that end users currently have this freedom. So thanks, Microsoft. That was really nice of you. Unfortunately, they only did this for x86 systems. If you buy a system running Windows RT, so a Windows system based on an ARM CPU, uh, they're restricted boot systems. They implement the same code, but they do not have the option to replace the keys with your own keys. You are not permitted to disable the functionality. So, boo Microsoft. There's still kind of an elephant in the room here. Um, if you're doing this on a PC, the thing that does the initial validation is the system firmware. Now, remember, back at the start, I mentioned a case of a piece of malware that reflashed the system firmware. That is, in theory now, impossible. On all these systems, it's not supposed to be possible to reflash the firmware unless the firmware is signed with a trusted key. Unfortunately, that's a completely different trusted key to the ones in the key database. Rather than the user being able to replace that key, that key is part of the firmware itself. So you download the firmware, you copy the firmware into RAM, you reboot the system with a magic option set. The firmware looks at this RAM, sees this code, verifies that the signature is correct, and if the signature is correct, then it flashes the firmware. If it's not, it refuses to, and you just boot normally. So that means that anyone with access to your firmware vendor's signing key can replace your firmware, and if they can replace your firmware, they can replace the cryptography checking codes. They could embed their own key in there. That means that you still trust your firmware vendor for two reasons. Firstly, this key. Secondly, the fact that you've well, unless you're running a system written by AMI, then you do not have access to the source code. AMI would still prefer you not to have access to that source code. It leaked off a vendor site in Taiwan. Uh, you can probably find it on BitTorrent. I haven't looked. Is it you're trusting closed source code that you don't have the source code to, and you're assuming that their implementation is correct, and you're assuming that it hasn't been deliberately backdoored. And even if that is true, you're trusting that they maintain control of their key, that they will not cooperate with a government that is hostile to your interests. This isn't ideal. There is a potential alternative. Core Boot is a free software licensed firmware implementation that is capable of bringing up many different chipset motherboard combinations. Unfortunately, nothing particularly contemporary. I think the most recent systems it boots are kind of 2009 vintage, 2010. That may not be entirely true. But the problem with Core Boot is that right now, as it stands, Core Boot doesn't implement any of this validation checking. You can ensure that Core Boot is correct, you can flash Core Boot, and then your system will be back in a state where it will boot anything, whether you trust it or not. Tiano Core is the reference implementation of UEFI. It's, again, 
free software. It's under a permissive BSD style license. You can download it from SourceForge. It has a reference implementation of the secure boot code, and you can, in theory, um, if, weirdly, Google have been working on this, an implementation of Tiano Core that you can boot on top of Core Boot. So Core Boot does your hardware initialization, your very low level hardware setup, and then Tiano runs on top of that. And they would have a secure boot implementation. The user would have the ability to modify the keys. The user would have everything they want. Problem there is that the NVRAM on your system, which contains the keys, you want to be able to write to that, but only if you can verify that those writes are correct. Now, a modern system, in the past, if you were in an operating system, you could just write to NVRAM directly, which meant there was no security at all. More modern systems deal with that by setting a flag at boot, which then prevents writes to NVRAM. You can only read from it unless you're in something called system management mode. So system management mode is this special CPU state where the CPU stops running your operating system and goes off and does something else entirely and doesn't bother telling you that it's doing this. Uh, which is a little concerning. But in, in system management mode, it's able to do the right. So the way this is normally handled is you say, I want to write to NVRAM, and here is my signed NVRAM update. Then there's a magic the firmware writes to an address, that address writes, trips the processor into system management mode, the processor then, while running code you can't get at, and which is therefore by definition trusted, verifies the signature and then does the write to NVRAM. There's no implementation of that for core boot yet, and that would need to be added for people to be able to build a fully trusted system. And then you've got stuff like the CPU microcodes, the software that runs on your CPU. Uh, that is written in an entirely undocumented format. Again, you can't replace it without having access to Intel signing key. There is currently no evidence that Intel or AMD provide modified microcode for the use of, say, the US government. I mean, there's no evidence that they don't either, except for the fact it would be really fiddly and awkward. But it's entirely possible if you're going to be really paranoid, you would want a CP that's only running microcode you can trust, which means right now there is no x86 processor on the market that can do that. Weirdly, you're going to find it easier to trust an ARM core made in China. So there are um, open firmware implementations. Uh, Oh yeah, there's also the embedded controller, which is a small microcontroller on your motherboard. It's usually an 8051 derivative. It does magic things. Uh, it does fan control, it's your keyboard controller. It is able to do pretty much anything that you could imagine a device attached to your motherboard could do, which is obviously a lot of things. And that firmware is often still closed, even if you're running core boot. Uh, some work to be done there. We can almost produce computers that only run free software. You can buy uh, a MIPS-based system from China that has a fully documented CPU, that has a core boot-based firmware. Uh, I believe the embedded controller is still closed, but you could replace that. And you could then build on top of that a full secure boot implementation that was under the user control. And we should do that. We should produce software that is only running free software when it's provided to you. But more than that, it seems worthwhile for us to produce software that will only run free software, that will refuse to run software that does not provide users with appropriate freedoms. I'm not saying that all computers should do this. I think that it is a vital freedom that people should be permitted to run proprietary operating systems if they want to. But I think that there is a worthwhile use for uh, devices that will only run free software. Uh, I, the fact that it's open doesn't mean it's trusted. Nobody has reviewed every single line of the Linux kernel, of the C library, of X11, of all the software that's running on your system. We don't really know what a fully trusted operating system looks like. We have not as yet produced an operating system that you can say, yes, I trust that this is only running my code all the time, while still being generically useful. That's going to be an interesting challenge. So, in summary, user control is pretty vital. Uh, users should be able to choose 
and change the software that's running on their system, whatever that system is, be it a laptop, be it a phone, be it your television. And the ability to control what your system runs is important. I should be able to say, I do not want to run this software. I should be able to say, I do want to run this software. And right now, those suboptimal in various ways, including Microsoft being the default root of trust, UEFI Secure Boot is the closest we have to this ideal, and it can be used in ways that enhance user freedom. So, I think we've got about five minutes for questions, maybe slightly under. How does revocation work? Uh, there's two key databases. There's a whitelist of keys that are used for deciding whether or not you can run a piece of software. And then there's something called the key exchange keys, which allow you to update that whitelist. So you push out, if you want to revoke a key, there's an analogous blacklist. So there's DB, which contains keys that say you should be able to run stuff. And then there's blacklist DBX, which says anything signed with these keys or which has this hash should not run. And you can push out DBX updates that's assigned with any key that's in the KEK database. Again, Microsoft guarantee that you are able to change the KEK keys. Uh, so you can remove Microsoft's keys such that Microsoft can no longer blacklist anything on your system. Um, but the idea there is that your operating system vendor pushes out a signed update that contains new revoked keys, new revoked hashes. The system will never go online to check for the revoked keys itself unless you permit the operating system to do this, then your system will run whatever you want it to. You won't get any revocation updates. You cannot, no. Um, it will reject any updates unless they're signed with a key that's in KEK, which is basically the system vendor and Microsoft. Yes, yes, um, vendors should try not to lose keys. Yeah, I think the problem with putting it directly in the CPU is that then people would claim that, say, Intel were trying to steal the markets instead. There's, there's a very interesting tightrope balancing act here of trying to provide security without behaving in an anti-competitive way. And it's, were one cynical, one could say that Microsoft's uncharacteristic devotion to user freedom may have been influenced by their desire not to be sued by the US government again. <laughs> Uh, that would be harder for Intel. If there was a cross-vendor thing, well, then maybe that would be illegal, uh, anti-competitive cartel building. Who knows? I know. I'm not a lawyer. Yes, each stage uh, verifies the next step. UEFI itself is out of the picture once the bootloader has been verified. The bootloader then verifies the operating system kernel. The kernel could, in theory, then verify user space if it wanted to. So you could build a system that will only execute trusted user space as well. And that would arguably be a little user hostile. So uh, I don't think anyone's shipping something like that outside of embedded kind of situations. Uh, okay, there is nothing that is a cross-vendor specification for how to do trust further down the chain. Uh, there's a de facto one in the Linux world, which is based on Shim, an application that I wrote, which provides a signature verification service while you're still within the UEFI environment. So the bootloader can call back into... Shim's a first-stage bootloader. It's the one that's signed by Microsoft, whatever, and then it loads Grub, and then Grub can call back into Shim to perform verification for the kernel. The kernel then has to do its own verification because the kernel can't rely on firmware. So uh, in Linux, we have a module signing infrastructure in the kernel. So when you build your kernel, you sign all the modules as well. And we're out of time. Uh, so thanks, everyone. I'm here for the rest of the week. If anybody does have any further questions, feel free to grab me. Thank you.